waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which, for, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about them, him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause a falling and rising in many of, in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the star of Asher, tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. This is the gospel of the Lord. You'll have noticed that our readings throughout the morning are kind of focused on what happens after the manger. Uh, and sometimes we sort of get to Christmas Day and then, uh, and then we, we sort of quickly jump on to other things. But there's these amazing stories of Jesus in his early days that are worth pausing and spending time on. Merry Christmas again, though. I'm, I see it as my pastoral duty to hold you in Christmas, all right? So we're going to keep saying it. And what I, what I want you to do when you get to the chocolate bar afterwards is, is don't think about the diet plan, okay? Just go to town on the hot chocolate bar because Christ is born. <laughs> I always want to watch James Bond movies at Christmas. Um, there's something in me that it gets to Christmas time and I just need to see Sean Connery drive an Aston Martin. And, and for the record, in case there's any discussion about this, he is James Bond and all other are actors. <laughs> for a long time, I knew you were my people. Now I know for sure. <laughs> the thing that makes me want to watch James Bond actually lives in you as well. It's not like a penchant for sexist character heroes or gratuitous killing of bad guys stylized as whoever, whoever the UK didn't like when they were making that particular James Bond movie. No, there's something deeper in me that draws me to watch James Bond movies at Christmas time, and it's in you as well. For me, it's because of this. When I was a kid in the UK, there was only four channels on UK television. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know what Canadian TV was like in the 80s, but for me, there was four TV channels. Two of them turned off at like nine o'clock at night. And for whatever reason, and I'm not certain what the reason was, one of the UK TV channels every Christmas showed a James Bond movie. It was like, there was just like, what will this year's James Bond movie be? So some of my earliest and happiest memories of Christmas are being at my grandparents' house with both my parents, all of us in that semi-comatose state because of the volume of turkey and trimmings that we have just consumed. So my family Christmas gatherings were somewhere between sort of 16 and 20 people gathered around this table just eating excessive amounts of food. And so, we're, so we'd be there in the evening, overfilled with food, overwhelmed by new toys, and James Bond would be in the background saving the world with nothing but a Rolex and some scuba diving gear. This was our tradition that we did as a family. And so there's something in me every year when I don't watch a James Bond movie, I find myself feeling like, was it really Christmas? And I know that as a biblical scholar and a pastor, I should have better Christmas traditions than that. But there's something about that. And I think it's in you as well. You'll have your traditions. 
that are deeper than you perhaps even realize, but there'll be things that happen in, the, in a Christmas that sort of draw you into them. Am I right? There's things that you will have. Maybe it's a place that you go, or it's a person that you see, or a particular food that you only have at Christmas time. And of course, for some of us, those traditions didn't happen. Uh, perhaps you, like me, now live far from home, so Christmas has a sort of loneliness to it that you haven't experienced perhaps in the past. Or perhaps, more sadly, someone passed on this year, and therefore Christmas felt slightly different as a result of that. Or maybe, maybe you just can't make stuffing like your grandma used to, and every year Christmas just doesn't quite work because her stuffing was better than anybody else's. In a world that's convinced that the next best thing is just around the corner, Christmas does something special in our hearts. It draws us to traditions. It draws us to things which go before us. Most of you, my suspicion is, didn't sit down when you were planning this Christmas and say, let's make sure this Christmas is like no Christmas we've ever had before. Right? Like you save that for birthdays. <laughs> but for Christmas... We want the traditions. We want to connect ourselves to the past and our past. And I'd love if you noticed how the gospel text today spoke to that so beautifully and so clearly. Joseph and Mary take Jesus to Jerusalem to the temple. Why? Why did they take a baby to the temple? Like, it doesn't sound like the most amazing day out, but they take their baby to the temple because of the traditions. The text tells us it's what the law asks them to do. It's what everybody that has a baby does in Israel at that particular time. If you really want to do things properly, you take your baby to the temple. And you see, they go to make these offerings and you get this little insight into Jesus' early life. They offer pigeons, which tells us that they're not an overly wealthy family. The law had rankings of how you should give and what you should give. And if you're offering pigeons, it means that you're not overrun with cash. So Jesus comes into our world, into the traditions, in and amongst some poverty and some poorness. And they encounter, encounter these two people. You heard them talked about in the gospel reading, Simeon and Anna. And one of the reasons I love pausing at this story is because we can run through the text and never hear of Simeon and Anna. If you don't hold to the whole Christmas story, you can kind of go manger and then you sort of come back at Easter and, and Jesus is a grown up now and seems to have got himself in a whole host of trouble. But there's these gorgeous little stories that are floating around in between there. And this one introduces us to Simeon and Anna. Blink and you miss them. And Luke tells us two things about Simeon and Anna. The first thing you pick up in the text subtly is they've been expecting Jesus. Like Jesus doesn't surprise them in the same way he seems to surprise everybody else. They maybe are surprised by the form, they're maybe surprised by the time, but they've, they've pitched their lives around waiting for Jesus. It's why I love talking about Simeon and Anna this morning after Advent, because we had this period of waiting. And then the first story we tell in Christmas season is of two people who are waiting. Simeon, the text says, has been watching and waiting. And notice what Luke also does. And this is something if you're ever reading Luke's gospel, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. He makes the point, not only is he watching and waiting, but the Holy Spirit is with him. So something's going on in him as he's watching and he's waiting. And then we meet Anna. And Anna has suffered, like terrible things have happened to this lady. And she's, she's still there watching and waiting, keeping the traditions, fasting and praying, knowing that God is not going to abandon her and therefore not gonna abandon her people. And she, we're told, is a prophet, also someone with the Holy Spirit on them. So these two people, distant from society perhaps, observing the tradition, staying close to the places of God and the Holy Spirit is upon them. And then Simeon offers us these words, beautiful words. I'm, I'm curious how many of us in the room were stirred as we read Simeon's words. In the Latin tradition, this, this prayer is known as the Nunc Dimittis, and it forms the final prayer of evening nighttime prayers in many of the Christian traditions of the world. So if you come from an Anglican background or a Roman Catholic background, some people have grown up within Lutheran traditions, Reformed traditions, if you prayed the daily offices, this prayer is a prayer that you have heard prayed a lot of times as you get ready for bed. This is the prayer you close your eyes to. 
So as you hear this prayer, perhaps even this morning, some of you are like, whoa, wait, that's, that's from the Christmas story? Because we hear this so many times if you're in one of those traditions. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. What a gorgeous sentence. I've waited, Lord. I've waited and I've waited and I've waited. And now if I went to sleep tonight and didn't wake up tomorrow, Simeon says, it would be okay. Why would it be okay? Because my eyes have seen your salvation. He's a little baby. He's just holding a baby. That's all he's got is a baby. But he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. I know, God, it's going to be okay. You feel the Christmas of this. That, that, that Simeon experiences what we all experience. We gather together, we, we lavish out our houses, we eat too much food. Why? Because a baby was born in a manger. It seems slightly out of touch with reality at some level. But here we see that the very first people to meet this baby understood something heavy is happening here. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared. Think about that word there prepared, something that's happened before. There's depth, there's tradition, there's history to this. You've prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. This is a stunning prayer. Simeon's saying, I've been waiting for this. He is the Advent person. I've been waiting and now I see it. Christmas is with us. Christmas is here. The second thing that Luke wants us to know is that Simeon and Anna are very, very old. He really doesn't want you to miss that. If you go back and read that text again this afternoon, he really makes a point and it causes issues for some of us because we're like, Luke, what are you getting at here? He's like, they're old. And, and you're like, yeah, I know what old is. No, 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 they're so old that Simeon's prayer is like, I could die tomorrow and maybe I will. And I'd be okay with that. And Anna, she's this terrible story where she's gotten married and was married for only seven years. Now, in that culture, often marriages happened amongst teenagers. So maybe in her early 20s, potentially, she, she loses her husband. And now she's 84. What has she done between becoming a widow and meeting Jesus this moment? She's been in the temple, praying, fasting, knowing that God is not a God to abandon her. So they're both very old and Luke wants us to know this and he wants us to see this because what can happen, I think, in this story, and I wonder if Luke knows this and I wonder if Luke is speaking to us thousands of years later that you're gonna get the impression, perhaps Luke would say to us as modern people if he were around today and we could understand him. So you're gonna get the impression that God is doing something new in Jesus and the problem with us as modern people is when somebody starts to do something new, we assume that everything that came before it was bad because the opposite of new is bad for us modern Westerners particularly. <laughs> and it's as if Luke wants us to see something here, that Jesus may be new, but look at who meets him first. It's the old, it's the people rooted in the traditions, it's the people that have the history. And they don't come to Jesus and go, oh my goodness, a brand new thing, we never saw this coming. Both of them were waiting for it, expecting it, looking for it, and recognizing that God was always going to do it. So this new baby arrives as part of what God has been preparing the whole time. And I think intrinsically we know that when we read Luke's story. This, this stunning image of these two old people holding this young baby, we recognize it. I've alluded to it already, but our world is obsessed with the new. We love the innovative. It's, it's like everything that we do, brand new, limited edition, stand and get ready for the, the new thing that's coming. Be excited about what's next. We praise the creative and the innovative and the people who are doing the things we've never seen before. But my guess is this, and I think Christmas tells us this, our souls, our souls long for something deeper. Our spirits long for something with roots and with history and with depth to it. In a few hours time, New Year's resolutions begin. Well, they begin before they inevitably fail. <laughs> if you must make a New Year's resolution, don't look for something new. Don't look for something fancy. Don't look for something shiny and innovative. The way of Jesus at Christmas calls us to pursue the tried, the tested, and the true. 
I think us as humans, one of the reasons our levels of burnout are so high, our levels of stress are so high, is that we're tired of relentless innovation. We're tired of relentlessly trying to come up with new things and be more creative. Because we know, deep down, we know it's shallow and it's exhausting. And one of the reasons why we love Christmas so much is we step into this season and it feels familiar. You get back, the, the year brings you back round and delivers you at Christmas and, you're, and, and something starts to release in your soul. Maybe for you, it's the James Bond movie because you're weird like me. Maybe, maybe it's something like the turkey trimmings. Maybe it's the decorations going up. Maybe it's the smell of a particular candle that you burn. There's something happens and your soul starts to relax because it's familiar space again. You know this space, you recognize this space. And I think there's something deeper than just nostalgia in that. I think there's a yearning of our souls to be connected to something truer, deeper, and bigger. And Christmas reminds us that the joy that we feel is because there's a story that tracks back thousands of years to something true and something real and something that two old people in Simeon and Anna looked at and said, yes, this is what God's been doing. And I think this is true of us as people. I think it's true of us as the church as well. I think the church has sold itself short so often by trying to build innovative churches instead of churches rooted in what's beautiful, true, and tested. And there's something hilarious going on, and I, I get these, these commercials come through into my Instagram feed regularly, and they make me laugh. That as we forget the wisdom of the old, as we forget the guidance of the traditions, as we step away from the ancient in pursuit of the innovative, have you noticed what seems to happen a lot in the media right now? I constantly get these commercials. Have you tried mindfulness? Mindfulness is good for your stress levels. Find spaces to be mindful. And then, and then also because I'm a middle-aged man, I get a lot of commercials for intermittent fasting. <laughs> like, thanks, Instagram, I'm just trying to wake up here. <laughs> what if you went without food? People that go without food find clarity of mind, it says, and, and clarity of soul, and they feel healthier. And then I'm always being encouraged to, uh, I'm always being encouraged to go on like epically long adventure journeys, go on long walks or long hikes or huge, huge adventures. It makes me laugh because I'm also a student of the monastic traditions. <laughs> and the old monks would call all of these things prayer, fasting, and contemplation. <laughs> you know? and, and it's like society's figured out, you know what would be really helpful to you? Is if you could occasionally find yourself in a space, be silent, and maybe talk to something bigger than you. And I feel like... <laughs> I feel like the people from a thousand years ago would come and kick our butts if they were like, like, we've been telling you this for a thousand years and you don't want to believe us. And it's like, it's this great new revelation that, you know what, your life will be better if you fast. <laughs> we're like, I think Jesus said that. But that doesn't sell the new program on Instagram. I appreciate that. But before we laugh too much about it, ask yourself this question. Would we spot the 84-year-old prophet? Would we spot that person who's faithfully always amongst us, standing in this space saying, God, I'm here because I know you're gonna do something. And so often in our own lives, we're so committed to that new that we notice less and less the depth of the people who are standing holding space for God. So maybe, just maybe, it's time to discover the ancient as the new. Like, I don't know about you, I wanna be less exhausted by trying to be innovative all the time. I wanna be more present to what the Holy Spirit is doing in me. I want to be more present to what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. And Jesus is surrounded by these traditions, by these spirituals. And notice what Simeon does, he blesses Jesus. His family participate in the tradition. They come to the temple, they meet a man who's been watching. And the net result is Jesus is blessed as a result of this. Like, I want to be blessed. I think you want to be blessed. We sit on this arbitrary day where tomorrow becomes a new year in the calendar. We buy new things to pin on the wall to track where we're up to on this year. And in one sense, it's arbitrary. In another sense, it does allow us pause to pay attention. And as we pay attention, perhaps our question is not what does next year look like as, a, as an innovation or a creative space, but what does it look like as a blessed space? What are the things that I can root myself in? The things that I find in Christmas are also there to be found in every day of the week. If Jesus can come and participate in something bigger and older and more connected, maybe there's something realer than new for all of us. 
And I think this is what Christmas is calling us to. Slow down, pay attention. And that's why this Galatians text that I opened the service with, I think is so profound for us. This text is often read in the church around about the same time as the Simeon story. And I wonder if you can see why. When the time had fully come, St. Paul says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Notice how Paul speaks to the deep tradition of Jesus, right? That Jesus, he, he arrives in the world like all of us arrive in the world. And he arrives in the world like all Israelite people arrive in the world. He comes in via a birth and he comes in underneath the law. It's fascinating that God innovates in the most traditional way ever. We're going to send Jesus to rescue us, and he's just going to arrive kind of looking like the rest of us. He's not going to look totally different and brand new. He's going to be different in a different way. He doesn't jet in. He arrives in these traditions. But notice this, and I'm working really hard to not talk for hours here, so, but it's hard when I talk about Galatians. Notice this. It says here that the reason Jesus comes in in this way is because he's here to redeem those under the law, so those in the traditions, the waiting, the Simeons, the Anna, so that we might receive sonship. Now, some translations are going to give you a series of different words to, to translate this, this Greek word sonship here. Some of them are going to lead towards uh, various different words. And, and you've got to be careful when you translate this because it's really easy to miss what points do it, what Paul's doing. It's going to appear ever so slightly sexist, but Paul is not being sexist here. But some of the translations, they kind of lean towards more gender neutral language and as a result, obscure what's going on. Notice what Paul does. You are his sons, he says. You are his sons. Now just hold that for a moment. Like what's going on? What is Paul meaning? But notice he says, you've received sonship. So you're not just sort of kind of patched onto the side of this family. You're not just the kind of visitor, like, you know, your, 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 you know, your kid came home with some weird friend from university and they're joining you for Christmas. You know, no, you're actually a son, Paul says. But what, why is that so important? Well, because God has a son. Right? It's the very reason we're in this room today. And now Paul's talking about you using the very same language as Jesus. Right? So we don't want to push that away into the distance and say we're distant relatives. We're like cousins to God. We're like just God's children. Paul says, no, no, no. You know of God's son. And now I'm going to talk to you in the very same language. You are his sons, he says. And because of this, then God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. You are so much God's son that his spirit is in you, Paul says. So this is not about gender. This is about Jesus. How like a son of God are you? How like Jesus are you? Paul says this, because of Christmas, you have exactly the same spirit in you as the spirit that was in Jesus, as the spirit that was in Simeon, who laid his hands and blessed Jesus, as the spirit who was in Anna, that hold, held her waiting for Jesus. How like a son are you? You're Jesus like a son. Well, how can I be certain, you say? You head into 2024, how can I be certain that God is really, really with me? Notice what Paul does here. That same spirit that's in you calls out, Abba, Father. Now, the word Abba is an Aramaic word. Aramaic is the language that Jesus would have spoken. So when Jesus prayed to his father, he will have said the word Abba. What Paul is saying is this, is that you are God's son because of Christmas. Because of Christmas, you are God's son and his spirit is in you. Not just a generic spirit, but the spirit of Jesus is in you. How can I be sure it's the spirit of Jesus? Because when the spirit of Jesus is in you, you start to sound like Jesus. You even talk to God in the same way that he talks to God. We all did it just a few minutes ago. Our father who art in heaven. Not because we kind of joined the family for Christmas dinner. Not because we kind of just, you know, dealt with a few navigation points to sort of be distant relatives. We pray our father because he is our father. How can he be our father? Because the spirit of Jesus lives in us and we call him our father. That's the Christmas miracle. The ancient, the new, the old hope, the fulfilled promise, all coalescing and conversing in us, converging in our lives so that we pray our father because he is your father. I don't know what 2024 holds for you, but here's what I know that you need. You need to know that God is already there. 
You need to know that God is ahead of you in 2024. And he has always been ahead of you in every year that you've gone into. And he's waiting for you and he's holding for you. And even though you don't know whether 2024 is gonna be better or worse than 2023, you will not be alone. And you're not just accompanied by a God who's with you alongside you, but the spirit of Jesus is in you and you are fully his. So don't go into 2024 looking for the new. Trust God's spirit for something better. My prayer for you is that you find the ancient to be ever new as God stirs you, holds you, protects you and guides you. As the clock strikes midnight tonight, the spirit of his son that cries out, Abba, Father, in your heart is still with you. Hold there for a moment. Lux is gonna come and lead us in the creed, an old ancient word of people confessing that Jesus is trustworthy. Please stand if you are able as we confess together in, through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.